Hello, my name is Emil Vargovic. As thank, thanks to Diana for such a lovely introduction. And I will continue with my topic for today. The topic is economic development in a global economy, with a focus on the post-millennium agenda. First of all, the basic structure of this lecture is as following. I will try to clarify the difference between the concepts of economic growth and economic development. And then I will try to define what is actually economic development with the focus on what does it actually mean for a country to be developing. After that, I will try to define what are the most relevant factors which are necessary for a development to occur. After that, the most important part of this lecture is actually to see what is the role of the global community and more developed countries in promoting overall <coughs> global development of least developed countries. Which, again, with the focus on the United Nations project called the Millennium Project, or more specifically, the Millennium Development Goals. So, first of all, what is economic growth? Economic growth is basically a really simple economic term. It's a technical term which actually describes that a country has an increase in its nation's uh, real output or gross domestic product. It is, as I said, purely, uh, purely technical term because it just assumes that there is greater quantities of natural or capital resources or human resources and that there are improvements in the quality of resources and that there are uh, techn technological advances that will actually boost productivity. Uh, there are many different, many different theories of economic growth ranging for liberal theories such as the neoclassical solo theory or to more interventionist theories of economic growth, such as the Keynesian theory of growth, which hopefully I will not do today. So. Uh, but the other hand, <coughs> what is important to, to, to note is that the traditional economics did not actually make any difference between the concepts of economic growth and economic development. However, economic development is basically, or in short, it's a much, much broader concept. And it is also a normative concept, because we assume and we add certain values to the concept. We are just not describing the current state in certain economics or anything like that, but just we are trying to define what would be a developed country. The problem with the concept of economic development is that there is no single definition. There, are many, there have been many numerous definitions over the time, and basically, Every single author or economist or philosopher had a different interpretation of what development should be. One of the most important or most recognizable definitions is from Michael Todaro, which is one of the pioneers of economic development, the concept and the development economics. According to him, uh, economic development could be defined as not just a pure economical phenomenon, but rather a multidimensional process involving reagrupation reorganization and restructuring of entire economic and social system. Therefore, development is not just a condition, but it's also a process of change over time. To continue, what are the most important aspects of economic development? First of all, as I said, it's a long-term process. Second, it's a process of improving the quality of people's lives through creation of new jobs or new wealth and also the restructure of the whole economic system as, as such. The term economic growth is usually associated with already developed countries. For example, the United States doesn't uh, have any more problems of developing, the rather they have a problem of growth and sustainable growth. On the other hand, the concept of economic development is usually associated with the less developed countries. In the end, the, the content and the robustness of the policies that will be used and the scope of government intervention will actually depend on the definition that we choose. For more broader definitions, such as those who, uh, who, who that constitute the, the concept of absolute poverty, such as one dollar per day, will need only limited government intervention and restructuring. But on the other hand, if you use a more robust definition of economic development, such as putting more focus on the concepts such as um, relative 
inequalities, relative poverty and human development index. In that case, we will need additional government interventions. That is important to understand. However, the concepts of economic growth and economic development are closely related in the theory which is called the poverty trap. For example, if you assume that in a certain country there is low income, the first consequence of having a low income per capita in a certain country is that people will have low levels of education and healthcare. Second point is there will be low levels of human capital in general. Then the fact that there is low education and low human capital will result in low productivity, which, which will again cause even lower states of income. Then lower states of income will spill into low savings. If you don't have national savings, you'll have low prosperity of investment. And if you don't have investment, you'll have low economic growth. And then again, low income. And this is called the vicious circle. It cannot be broken that easily. So if you observe closely, the concepts of growth and development are really closely related. What are the obstacles and the sources of development? There are four basics, four basic uh, conditions for it. Natural resources, which are important but not the most important part of it. Because there are countries which have succeeded in developing without greater amount of natural resources, for example, Japan. The most important aspect of development is human resources. Because human resources are the basis of economic development and growth. Purely economical conditions are capital formation and technology. If you have greater amounts of capital accumulation, and technology, you have greater results in achieving development. And the final condition is, of course, the social, the social cultural and institutional factors, which are based on culture, tradition, and various types of customs. The point is, all of these conditions can have a positive and a negative effect on economic growth and economic development. How to describe underdeveloped countries? Well, basically, it's not that difficult. We all know that underdeveloped countries are predominantly characterized by low per capita incomes, macroeconomic instability, low levels of education, low levels of productivity and capital accumulation, lack of basic services, extreme poverty, and greater levels of social inequality. However, the problem is actually explaining how certain countries have become underdeveloped. There is no single theory and there is little hope that there will ever be a strong enough theory to describe all the problems of every underdeveloped countries in the world. However, better question then will be how to promote development in general. In history, I do apologize, it's in Croatian, but... Uh, in history, there, is, there, have, there have been several consensuses and the main difference or dilemma of development was should the driving force of development be the market forces or the state forces, government forces? The most important consensuses in the world were after the Great War, the Second World War II, there was a Keynesian consensus, which basically allowed for the state to have a greater impact in driving the whole development of certain countries. After that, and the crisis in the 70s, we had the so-called neoliberal paradigm of development, which is based better described as the Washington Consensus. Washington Consensus again broke in 1990s and after that we are basically now in a certain vacuum because there is no specific theory on how to proceed after this. The general idea is that since the market forces or the liberal forces did not succeed to, to the greater scale, we should again allow more extensive role for the state. However, in 2000, in the year 2000, the United Nations began its biggest project in development called the UN Millennium Project, which is based on several goals in order to achieve greater economic development throughout the world. There are 
eight basic conditions or goals. First, and most important, to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. Or more, or more specifically, to have the amount of people living under one dollar per day. Other important goals are to achieve universal primary education, to promote gender equality, to reduce child mortality, to improve maternal health, to combat various types of diseases, to ensure environmental sustainability, and in the end, to develop a more broader or transnational network of, of aid and assistance. So, did this glorious project succeed? Already in 2009, there were certain problems with it. The biggest problem was that many countries actually were failing short of the most goals that were subscribed. That was the problem. The situation improved in 2014, which are basically the last uh, available data because the, the whole project ends next year. The red, the red boxes are basically the points where, uh, where uh, the points where uh, the least uh, success has been managed. The green ones are okay. And everything in between are not fulfilled. So there is, as you may see, there is still a lot of work to be done. <clears throat> so, what are the problems of this framework? Millennium Development Goals. First, there was a lack of analysis and justification for the chosen objectives, which basically reduced the whole project to nothing more than a wish list. Second, the problem was that certain measurements uh, are, were not available to actually measure success yet. After that, there are a lot of problems because a lot of inequalities which will actually, were actually mixed between uh, aggregate indices such as uh, global and national averages. And the most important problem with it was basically the lack of commitment by the developed and rich countries and the fact that um, Millennium Development Goals actually left some of the key issues out of it, such as human rights, environmental sustainability, and so on. However, it is not all bad. There are certain strengths of the whole framework. First of all, the, the, biggest, the biggest achievement of this project was that a limited number of goals, only eight of them, uh, was achieved under global consensus, which means basically that countries had certain interest in promoting such goals and they found it worth of pursuing. Second strength was that uh, it was a useful vehicle for a civil society organization to hold their governments accountable for their public promises. And the final strength was that the whole project actually promoted better collection of data in order to assess their progress. And if you have better data, you, have, you will have a better understanding of what actual development is and how to achieve it in the future. So, as I said, the Millennium Project ends next year. And now it is time to decide what should we do with next. It is time to construct a new framework for development. The general rule of the United Nations was to keep the whole format just continue it or upgrade it in certain degrees. What should be upgraded? First of all, the end of one project is an opportunity to incorporate issues that were part of the Millennium Agenda, but were actually not included yet. For example, human rights, environmental sustainability, and inclusive social development. In the end, I have certain uh, additional suggestions what to do. First of all, we need better understanding of development. Second, we, the concept of development should be considered as a complex and continuous changes of interactions between past and present, natural and human environments, external and internal conditions. And most importantly, my suggestion for today, the new framework should not be uh, just dominated by the economic discipline. It should be interdisciplinary and it should be in universally accepted but still flexible to adjust to, to various different local conditions. And of course, the most important part is to strengthen global partnership. 
which must be redefined in order to truly achieve global partnership in order to achieve development, with clear, with clear accountability frameworks for both developed and developing countries. And to conclude, returning to Michael Tudaro's definition, maybe it is time to accept a broader, more robust definition of development with three basic goals. The first goal should be raising people living levels. The second should be creating conditions which are conducive to growth of people's self-esteem. And the third suggestion is to increase people's freedom to choose. None of this can be achieved without the synergic effects between the market, the state and the global community. So my conclusion is of this rather short lecture is that the challenge of reducing global poverty is really important. And the fact that there is no single definition on how to achieve it should not be uh, an obstacle. Uh, millennium development goals are the step in the right direction. However, there is still yet a lot of to be done. The overall vision of the Millennium Development Goals has brought the international community together and this is the most important part that we should continue working on. Thank you.